In this episode of the Plutopia podcast, we discuss the various technologies and sites that comprise the Fediverse. Johannes Ernst and Tom Brown have explored the Fediverse since the early days of the movement for an alternative to big social media. Think of social media. Is this one linear feed there that somehow, you know, streams by you the best we can do? Is this all we can do? Can we can we organize this differently, for example, or you know, have, have different kinds of friend classes or like the Google Plus I used to do back in the days. And you know, there's so many innovation innovative things you could do if you could innovate as an innovator, but you can't do on top of Facebook or on top of Twitter or any of these things, but you can in the Fediverse. One of the big problems that the world has is that so many of our communication channels from mass media to social media are fundamentally manipulated um, by interests that we cannot see and we cannot understand and we would probably disagree with if we knew where they were. And so one of the premises on the, on the societal level that the Fediverse has is that we are building a communication network that at least can be not manipulated by unaccountable third parties, which is like a huge proposition as far as I'm concerned. Welcome to the latest edition of the Plutopia News Network. I'm John Lepkowski, uh, co-host, along with Scoop Sweeney, my pal over there. And our guests today are Johannes Ernst, who's a technologist, an entrepreneur, and a community organizer, and Tom Brown, a software developer and beer league hockey player. But we're not going to talk about hockey today. Well, we could, but instead, I think we're going to talk uh, quite a bit about what's happening on the internet, particularly about the Fediverse, uh, which, uh, well, I don't know. Johannes, do you want to explain to us what the Fediverse is so that people won't be puzzled? Sure. So. So well, well, thanks, John, and uh, and Scoop for for having me. Uh, I think this is a very t- uh, timely discussion here. Um, I just read uh, ten minutes before I got on this uh, 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 on this uh, recording here that there's a prediction that 2024 is going to be the year where the Fed worse is becoming mainstream. Now you may agree with that or disagree with that one, but the predictions are popping up, so it's a good time to discuss this. So the Fediverse, you know, depending who you ask, is something else for slightly uh, for, for for different people. It's a little amorphous, but the way I would think of it, it's the first decentralized social communications network that we have, an evolution of social media that's not controlled by any one big platform, but where everybody can show up with the software that they like to run and connect with other people and other companies and other subjects and other machines and all sorts of things. It's a little bit like email. You pick your email provider and then you talk to everybody else. Um, the Fediverse is the same for what we think of uh, when we think of Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all of these things, but all together in one place. So imagine that you are an Instagram and you can see the posts on um, Reddit. Uh, or you are on Reddit and see the posts uh, from, you see all your friends have the same friends as you would have on Twitter or whatever it may be called these days. Um, but it isn't a place that you pick. And so you get to pick your terms of service. You get to pick how much money you're going, you're going to pay for it. You get to pick whether you want to see any ads because there is alternatives for all of these things. So there's a ton of choices here that all of a sudden makes social media interesting again. <laughs> Because well, what we've had so far is all, all, you know, the same thing ten, uh, that we've had for 10 years. One question that occurs to me there is who owns the data? You do. Fundamentally, because you're right, because you fundamentally say as a, if you are and, and the, the, the spectrum of users, of course, from the goes from the very geeky to the very, very non geeky. If you are a very, very geeky person, then you go like, oh, I'm writing my own code and I'm going to interact with everybody. And it's your own code, you run it the way you want and you do whatever you please. Nobody will prevent you from doing that. And you can still interact and communicate with everybody. On the other hand, if you are a, a pure consumer and you don't really care about this at all, then you find yourself an instance that you like, like maybe the one that your friends use or one that has a particular uh, business model or funding model that you appreciate uh, in a privacy policy. And then maybe that's hosted in a Swiss bunker because you like it to be hosted in a Swiss bunker. Then you pick this one and you communicate with everybody else 
just um, as everybody else, but with the terms and the context that you um, you choose. So it's a brave new world. <laughs> How secure is uh, the communication over these networks? Is it end to end or is it just uh, depend on uh, who you are and who you're connecting to? So, you know, social media by and large is in, in regardless where is not, is not intended to be really secure because you're talking to the world. Right. Uh, I mean, if you're posting on Twitter, you want lots and lots of people to see it. It's not like you want that to keep this very private. That's not what the tool is for. And so um, the Federal is the same way. So the assumption is that many people see it. If you're looking for something where you want to keep uh, the conversation private with somebody, you know, social media generally is not for you. Uh, you're picking something like Signal or, 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 or a messenger like, like that. But that's a that's a different uh, that's a different uh, problem. <clears throat> So I, I, I think of the Fediverse as a way to get away from a system like Facebook that sort of holds users hostage. You know, the fact that you're on Facebook because the people you know are on Facebook and the only way for you to interact with them is on Facebook. But if you leave Facebook and you go somewhere else, then there's a cost to you, which is that you lose those connections. Whereas in the Fediverse, you can pretty much always connect to everybody else who's in the Fediverse, regardless of which platform you're using. But a question I have about that is you've just talked about, and you've, you sent some notes about, which I just had time, time to barely scan, but you had some notes about a meeting with the people from Meta uh, and, uh, and their intention to connect to the Fediverse it, are they undermining their own business model if they make that connection? So that is um, the ten thousand dollar question. Um, so since I, I took those notes uh, from a from a meeting at Meta about a month ago, um, they actually have put um, in place the first. Uh, it, it's actually working in some places. Uh, so a, a month ago it wasn't there yet, but now it is. And so you can actually, or and I do, follow some people. Not many yet because they're doing a very limited rollout um, uh, initially, gradually. Um, but I can follow several people on threads from my Mastodon uh, instance that I'm using, which is really a, a proof that this is beginning to work. Right? Imagine that I can pick my place that I want to use my software. In my case, as a cooperative, because I like my 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 Mastodon instance to be hosted by a cooperative uh, that I have a say in. And I can uh, follow somebody uh, on uh, in the inside the Meta Empire. Now, why exactly Meta does this is a little unclear. There's many many uh, th theses around that that go from uh, embrace and extend. They just want to take over this network to the regulators in the EU made them do it. Uh, if you ask them the threads people directly, why are you doing this? They're, what they tend to say is exactly your point, which is the creators on the big platform uh, on the big platforms uh, in the in the meta network have asked them to be able to take their content and their followers away from the platform and put it somewhere else that's what they say as the reason why they do this and as a result they decided to do activity pub which is the standard underneath the the fediverse or one of the standards around the, underneath the fediverse so they could take the followers and the content somewhere else that's exactly that point. Uh, now, whether this all comes that way, we will see. But so far, everything is going to uh, is pointing in the right direction. That's actually pretty interesting. I was surprised to hear it, and I wondered if it was a promising move. Um, I I think of so Cory Doctorow talks about the idea of platform decay, like. He refers to it as in shitification, the fact that platforms, as they grow and as they gain more users, tend to become less useful. Uh, the quality of the platform diminishes as they become more focused on trying to make real, I guess, make money with the platform, find uh, various ways to profit from it. Um, and I wonder if there's any even remote possibility that the Fediverse would be subject to platform decay. 
that's a good question. And I don't think anybody has actually asked that question yet that I'm aware of. And the reason why is because the Federal Reserve is so new. I mean, it, on, on some level, it's not new. It's been around in various forms for about 10 years, but at the very, very margins of, 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 uh, of the internet. Uh, only since you know a certain crazy billionaire took over a certain microblogging service has the has the uh, uh, has it sort of ended in the more of a mainstream uh, consciousness, but we're still the very very early, um, you know, uh, in terms of the the potential um, uh, growth story, and so nobody's really thinking about you know what's what happens at the tail end of that growth story. But I would think that uh, that if you have an open network, an open network allows people to innovate. And it in, inherently makes it less possible for an incumbent to extract the last, you know, ounce of value out of a captive audience because the captive, you know, for, for example, it took a, a look at Facebook. I mean, the number of ads that we see in our Facebook feeds has now reached sort of a critical mass from my perspective. You know, I don't think we can, they can do more ads because I'm not going to Facebook to only see ads. There, there, there's sort of a limit to this. And if something like this would happen in the very worst, I would just take my followers and my content and go somewhere else. Uh, so that is inherently uh, less likely uh, to 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 be um, subject to this platform decay. But it's too early really to tell. Yeah, I think they've uh, already ruined Instagram with ad frequency. Oh, Tom, were you saying something? Yeah, I I, I agree uh, with uh, Johannes. Uh, I I think that uh, it, it seems like like the the risk on the Fediverse uh, for so-called decay is the possibility that it becomes more centralized and less diverse than it is right now. So as soon as uh, everyone starts flocking to one server, then you, you have a, a, a problem of that capture. Well, in oh. re researching for this uh, interview, I looked at uh, Wikipedia, of course, and they show a list of more than 30 software packages, software uh, providers that uh, you use for the Fediverse, and they say you use for the Fediverse, for the Fediverse. How does, uh, that, is that helpful or is that a hindrance to where there is so much to choose from that people may not get the proper package to co communicate uh, with uh, the people that they want to have on the Fediverse. I, I personally think, think it's great as a technologist, it, it's challenging. And I, I know uh, uh, Johannes has an initiative to help kind of corral some, some of the, the chaos so that people are more standards compliant, but uh, definitely the strength the strength of the Fediverse is, is the diversity of um, uh, implementations. Yeah, I think we have been so educated that a social network comes from one company and one app that people get sort of queasy when the, it isn't like this, what's choice, choice, this is dangerous. I want one dish, you know, don't give me a long Chinese menu. I want just one dish and I will eat the dish of the day. And that's, um, but uh, it, that is really only true about social networking and some technology products like that. It isn't true about everything in the world. Nobody gets very queasy if they have, you know, a hundred different uh, vendors to buy their couch from. I mean, <laughs> you don't really care, uh, but even in technology, nobody gets queasy if you have a hundred different providers for email. Uh, right. I mean, some people, you know, have Yahoo email and some have Gmail and some get it from the ISP and it all works just fine. Uh, and nobody has any problems with that. And uh, uh, in email, it's somewhat harder to actually move from one email address to the other than it is in the Fediverse. Uh, so, but uh, I want to add one more thing. You're, you're right about the 30 packages or actually nobody knows exactly what it is and it's changing all the time. There is a lot of code being written as we speak right now. And so next year it is very possible. At the same time, it's 300 instead of 30. But it is innovation because each of these packages does something slightly different and does it in a slightly different ways. I, I mean, think of social media. Is this one linear feed there that somehow, you know, streams by you the best we can do? Is this all we can do? Can we, can we organize this differently, for example, or, you know, have, have different kinds of friend classes or like the Google Plus I used to do back in the days. And, you know, there's so many innovation, innovative things you could do if you could innovate as an innovator, which you can't do on top of Facebook or on top of Twitter or any of these things, but you can in the Fediverse. So all of these guys try out new stuff. And so for as an example, 
I'm a user of both Mastodon, which is very Twitter-like, and Lemmy, which is essentially a clone, uh, more or less a clone of, uh, of Reddit, uh, but they interoperate with each other. So now, uh, if I post something on Reddit, I can pass this on to my friends in Mastodon. So um, uh, this kind of innovation, you know, it's not a question of do I choose Lemmy or Mastodon. Actually, I choose both because they have they have different feature sets, and a lot of these thirty packages have actually different feature sets. <clears throat> yeah, I think probably what will happen is that it'll shake out at some point, and some some of those platforms will get most of the adoption, and some will go away. I mean, that's what always happens in markets. Okay. But the great thing about this is that we're getting away from this idea that everybody is on one central platform and you're on there with uh, advertisers and you're on there with celebrities and you're on, you're on there with a lot of people who are trying to sell you stuff. But now you can, you can pick a platform that has the right community for you, really, the right set of people. Right. And you don't have to be exposed to people that you don't necessarily want to be exposed to. And that, you know, to me, that sort of mitigates the problem. Well, the other problem that I can think of with Twitter and Facebook that I don't see with Mastodon is the idea of algorithmic presentation. You know, the fact that what you see is selected for you based on uh, a sort of AI assumption of what you really want to see. And, um, and, you know, I would rather make that choice for myself and I'd rather see things as they appear. And I'd rather see posts from people that I chose to see posts from and not from other people that the system thinks I might want to see. Uh, what I want to add to this one is it's not just the AI selection of this one, but the objective is not that you see what you what they think you want to see. The objective is to generate revenue for the platform provider. Okay, right, that, that's the objective. That's the only objective there is. Yeah, engagement. And so, well, and then there's proxies for this one. We, we find that the mm -hmm. revenue is higher, the engagement is higher, but ultimately the, the purpose, all right, the driver for all of this is that if I were to connect with you on Facebook, this communication channel is mediated by a third party in a way that it maximizes its revenue. It isn't mediated by what you want and what I want and what's good for us and what's good for the world and all sorts of things. It, it, it is, that's the objective. And so we do not have that in the Fediverse. And so as a, it is actually a sort of an untarnished direct communication channel. And I just had this conversation with, 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 with some people on Mastodon yesterday. Um, one of the big problems that the world has is that so many of our communication channels from mass media to social media are fundamentally manipulated. Um, by interests that we cannot see and we cannot understand and we would probably disagree with if we knew what they were. And so one of the premises on the, on the societal level that the Fediverse has is that we are building a communication network that at least can be not manipulated by unaccountable third parties, which is like a huge proposition as far as I'm concerned. I have one other concern uh, that I think is a pretty valid concern uh, Let's just speak of Mastodon. Uh, Mastodon uh, enables the creation of many servers and pretty much anybody who has the right technical prowess can set up a server and people can come onto that server. And if the load is significant enough, there may be you know, higher and higher costs to maintaining the server. Uh, and I know the first Plutopia account that we set up uh, on Mastodon, we set up on a server that ultimately went away and we didn't get the memo that it was going away. So we lost our, you know, we lost our, uh, uh, the, our follows at least. We, we lost the data that we could have ported out of there before it dropped and had to start over again. And I have a question about, you know, how do you, how do you know whether a server that you select is going to be around as, is reliable, you know, and is well supported? It, 
Is there any rating system for servers? Maybe we need something like that. I, the, the only way I, I can do it is just word, word of mouth. I, I don't know how else to judge servers. I would say it's, you know, it's, it's very similar to other services you want. If you buy a car, you know, you want this car to be maintained. So you're going to look like, is this car company going to be around? Uh, or you, you know, you have any kind of service contract. Is my gardener going to be around uh, for a long time? You, you, you're making these, these evaluations. Um, and, uh, and some of them will be your friends and word of mouth. And some of them you look at, you know, oh, these guys have, you know, whatever the backing of all of these people and so forth and so forth. So it's, it's no different from other parts uh, of life. However, there is one big difference um, in, in, in that the Fediverse to this day does not really know how to fund itself. Um, the amount, the, the, the Fediverse runs to, to the vast majority uh, uh, at, at, uh, at uh, voluntary contributions open source style by people who volunteers in one way or another on the software development side and the operations side and the moderation side, there are lots of volunteers. Uh, and the, the, where there is money, it's uh, overwhelmingly donations in one way or another that aren't, you know, they're on the real business model where you must pay in exchange for service. And so because it's volunteers, then sometimes the volunteers go like, I've had it. This is too much work. Let's just turn it off. Uh, right. And, and that's, I mean, this is, if you, if you don't pay for it, you know, you can't expect <laughs> this being around, uh, in even the commercial social media, you're paying for it, uh, just indirectly, but by, by, uh, by, through the ads. So, the, but the Federal needs to figure out how it sustainably can fund itself. And, um, on the other hand, it is a, another one uh, of these examples where, um, there will be a vast variety of ways of funding this one, all the way from. You know, the Messinas or a, a model where somebody says, I just set this up, I, I'm a billionaire, whatever, I'm going to run this for the next, you know, 100 years because I like this thing, right? All the way to you must pay, you know, a subscription model. Uh, I want to get back very quickly to the co-op that I'm a member of because I think this is a really interesting fund room of funding models. Uh, and I think, Tom, you were too, right? Is that true? You also sort of co-op? No, I, I'm actually self-hosting. Oh, you're self-hosting. I see you even better. You you know how long your funding lasts, which is basically you do it as long <laughs> yeah. as you need it, right? But uh, bad, uh, so bad, for... bad news. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, a, there's a handful now of co-ops that basically where a bunch of people got together and then said, we'd like to have a social media server and we'd like to control it ourselves. So mine is social.coop. There's one in Canada uh, called, I think, uh, CA Social. Uh, and um, I'm paying a ridiculously small amount of money, uh, I think like two or three dollars a month, which is into the co-op. Um, and there's different pricing structures for this one. But me and all the other members of the co-op bundle their money. As a result, they're paying for the service and they pay a little bit for the administration. And it is sustainable. It's never going to be a big business, but it pays for what needs to pay for. And in exchange, we also get a vote. So imagine, for example, if you are uh, getting off Facebook um, enraged because one of your posts was banned or, you know, you saw too many Nazis on Twitter, you have no recourse whatsoever. If I am a member of a co-op and I have a vote like all other members in the co-op and it's all equal, I fundamentally have a say of what the moderation policy is. It's democracy in action, you know, in a, in a, in a sort of a paid for context. And I think this is a beautiful model. All right, because now we can say um, on our instance, we are going to, you know, um, accept, um, you know, pick something, sexualized talk, or we don't, uh, because that's the kind of community we want to, we want to build here. Uh, and, uh, um, and uh, you know, the, uh, for example, there was a vote as a, whether our instance should be federating with threads, uh, because Meta, of course, comes with a lot of baggage. Should we, you know, block them from the get-go or not? There was a long discussion about it, and finally a vote, uh, and that everybody has bought, bought into. And I think these models are really the kinds of things we need for social media much more than what we've grown up with in the last, you know, 10, 20 years. I spend a lot of time on internet radio. I've done that since the early 90s when it was <laughs> very limited in what it could do, and it's become uh, widespread uh, in, you know, around the world. But it's the big problem is uh, financing has really challenged the providers of internet uh, connections. Uh, one of the uh, 
a, one of the early free ones was uh, based out of out of Europe, Radionomy, and it was uh, suddenly purchased by United Music, which is the big music uh, business <laughs> conglomerate. And of course, it immediately was no longer free because you could get on there and have a free connection as long as you ran some of their little Mickey Mouse ads on your broadcast. But uh, once big business gets involved with whatever your project is, it's pretty much doomed to go one way or the other, go completely off the map or go completely uh, similar to what Meta has has become. It, uh, when I got on Facebook originally, it was kind of okay, but uh, the drive to become you know, a billionaire cert you know, certainly you know, put an end to that. And uh, there just doesn't seem to be any way to avoid successful anything on the internet being purchased or driven out of business by the big guys. Uh, yeah, so I would. Go ahead. Go ahead Tom. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely a case. Uh, small is small is beautiful. Uh, the The goal is not to get acquired. <laughs> You know, I think though this is not necessarily just a technology thing. I think it's true about a lot of businesses. You know, if you look like at the uh, all across the economy, if you look like at the numbers for uh, market concentration, uh, like say in the U.S. economy, then so many businesses are uh, so many markets are highly concentrated for the same reasons, and you know that's why we have antitrust laws, for example. And you know, one of the things that is um, the a wild card in all of this is the European Union with its very strong push over multiple years and multiple rounds of legislation to force some things open and more competitive than they have been. Right? They started with the GDPR, most, mostly on privacy and on personal data. And now we have a Digital Services Act and a Digital Markets Act that this, this year require, for example, that's what the provision says, the big platforms to provide um, real-time information access to third parties. Now, what exactly that means yet isn't be defined yet, and then nobody has done that yet. But there's legislation that is in effect, all right, that says they have to provide. They cannot capture the audience in a walled garden the way they have done in the past. Um, and it is a, a highly interesting um, uh, development to, to to follow because we have never had anything like this in, in a technology business, um, in a technology market where there are strong network effects. And and that gives me the you know sort of the 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 hope that between open protocols and open networks and the regulators getting into the business, we can at least stem and and sort of limit the dynamics that you were talking about. Of course, you know, we don't know yet, but this is sort of a new thing because we haven't seen this before. Yeah, I was just thinking about, I was trying to imagine, imagine, I was trying to see if I could imagine a way that a decentralized system like the Fediverse could really be subject to well, we were calling it platform decay earlier, but basically, I mean, if if you have to raise money for it, one way to do that is by like building your corporation and incorporating the thing and uh, seeking funding, get venture capitalists involved, whatever. Um, so the cooperative route makes sense, and it especially is a way to forestall any temptation to go that other route, you know, and I, but I think it kind of depends on the mindset and it depends on the level of greed involved. Uh, the impression I have is that the people who are involved are not greedy and that they're uh, absolutely trying to provide an alternative that will resist in Um so, I'm sure you yeah. agree with that. <laughs> So I think this is certainly an, an accurate state of the art. Uh, the Fediverse to, to this day is largely non-commercial. Um, sometimes we would say very much anti-commercial. Anything that involves money of any kind is hated by very substantial parts of the of the uh, of the Fediverse. You would think that all of the 
you know, all of the people and the political ends do, that would have, even without technology, would argue we shouldn't have money and everything should be a gift economy, uh, all in the Fediverse. <laughs> so that's where they naturally gravitate. But I think in the longer term, if we if we want the Fediverse to grow, and I mean by grow, bring the benefits we're talking about to more people than just a handful of millions that we have today, then um, we will see we will see and we'll have to see a broader variety of of um, entities participating. From my perspective, that's perfectly fine. I have no uh, no uh, uh, objection whatsoever that there is businesses trying to make a business uh, around the Fediverse as long as it is completely optional for people to participate, right? If, if, if there's somebody offers me a valuable service and costs money um, and I like that service, why shouldn't I be able to use this? Um, I don't see reason why not. Um, now, if they can force it down my throat, that's like, like Facebook can with, uh, with the ads, that, that's a different, uh, that's a different uh, subject, but we, we don't really have that problem. And so I, I, I would wel welcome a broad variety of business models and funding models and donation models and anti capitalist and pro capitalist and all sorts of people having a you know, non manipulated communication report between them. I think this is a great proposition. <laughs> we don't need to go beyond that um, because we have never had such a thing. Um, yeah, the yeah. whole idea of ad supported uh, anything uh, in to me at least, was always just a bit offensive. I started out in radio, in commercial AM radio, which was really a nasty place to work. <laughs> you were totally driven by the whims of your advertisers. And I ended up in public radio, which was not ad supported, but it's listener supported, which meant I immediately took a big pay cut because that's the right. big difference is, the advertisers allow you to be well paid, but if you're de depending upon the generosity of your listeners, you may or may not be getting well. And I've seen that in other lines of business as well. And that's the reason that, you know, my internet radio stations, I just don't do ads on them. It was just, uh, it was so offensive, the stuff that they, they want you to play. It's like, you know, I'd rather just pay for it and send it out as pure music. And that works for me, but that's not a good business plan. So how can the Fediverse support itself without having to you know, rely so much on ad revenue? Another good example uh, is Microdot Blog. I have a, a second account on Microdot Blog, and it's you know very reasonable, you know, like five or six dollars a month, and um, has some really cool features. Um, and, and is a very interesting implementation of uh, a Fediverse uh, server because it is kind of a hybrid between the, the, the Fediverse and the indie web space where people are also familiar with blogging. So it ha has to accommodate both those types of activities. But I, I think that it, you know, having skin in the game, whether it's a cooperative or something like micro.blog is, is very, very important. Mm -hmm. I would want to see, you know, lots of different experiments and lots of different models. You know, if some people like ads, and I mean, some people do like ads. This is, I think, one of the one of the reasons why there are so many users on Instagram. It's not that they hate ads; they actually like to see the ads, right? By all means, you know, if that makes it a free product and somebody likes to see it, by all means, you know, for, fine for you, right? Other people would like to pay a subscription. Other people like to benefit from somebody else's, um, uh, some else's, uh, essentially charitable, you know, providing of services. And then you, you can come up with all sorts of new models in an open network. For example, paid newsletters, right? It, it would be very straightforward to say um, uh, that I'm posting, but you only get to see my first paragraph and the rest of it costs money. Now, so to this, to this day, as far as I know, nobody has integrated micro uh, payments into, uh, into the Fediverse, but there is no technical reason why they couldn't do so. Right, so now you could say, this is the way I'm funding things. Uh, or, you know, it, 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 so there's all sorts of innovation that becomes possible if it's an open network and we only at the beginnings of this. And I think at the end of it, there will be some winning models, but many of them we cannot even anticipate at this point. Um, that would be my, my, uh, my guess because nobody really has played with the medium for a long time. You know, as an example, nobody really could foresee Uber as a business when the smartphone came out 
uh, but it made it possible um, after some people realized, oops, this is what I can do here. And I think we will see things like that in the Fediverse uh, in the future. When I, first, completely level of mm -hmm. when I first learned about the Fediverse, it was in the context of the independent web. I was at an indie web meeting and, uh, you know, we were talking about Mastodon and that was when I first signed up for Mastodon. I think that was what, 2017, Tom, something like that. Yes. So um, I, I wonder, is there a re relationship between the independent web and the Fediverse? There's not really a formal relationship, but there, they're sort of from similar intentions, right? Yeah. Is that, uh, is that correct? Uh, definitely. Uh, the Fediverse uh, meets a lot of the IndieWeb's design goals. Um, and uh, the, Indiver the in IndieVerse. <laughs> the, 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 That's it. <laughs> uh, you coined the, the term. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, the IndieWeb uh, ha has like uh, 10 kind of uh, uh, design uh, uh, goals, I guess. And, and, um, and what, you know, one of them is kind of like, uh, you know, just, you know, to be creative and, and own your, your own implementation to dog food, your implementation. And, you know, a lot, a lot of that, uh, uh, creativity and, and um, imagination is happening right now on on the, on the Fediverse, um, and, and then you know as Johannes was referring to earlier, the ability to to uh, own your own content, the canonical canonical version of, of your content is is uh, on a space of your choosing. You can have it on your own domain, which is a, a indie web uh, idea. Um, so so they they're they're very both the Fediverse and IndieWeb are very, very compatible, and and um, uh, the, the the big difference is is in the IndieWeb is is more focused on the the culture of blogging, and, and the the Fediverse is more of a federated model where there's uh, where people share servers in general. It's more about social media, right? Kind of a social media approach, and blogs. I mean, we used to kind of think of blogs as social media. It's, it's, I mean, the, the typical social media format we sometimes refer to as a micro blog and there's micro dot blog, which, you know, uh, <laughs> is an example of that. But, um, um, I think that blogging has, like long form blogging is, is rare now compared to, uh, 2017 and the years before that, that more people are just kind of flocking to social media. And with the independent web, I have the sense that not only do you have to have, or, or might you want to have something to say that requires more of a long form blog approach, um, but it's something that you can also share. But you kind of have to know something, right? You have to have some technical knowledge to really leverage the independent web. Am I wrong about that? Well, I, I guess the, right right now, the, the main exception I see is, is micro.blog. blog. If, if you're willing to pay a, a monthly fee, you can be very indie web uh, compatible and not need to know hardly any uh, tech to, to, to participate mm -hmm. in, in a, that interactive blogging experience. Does WordPress.com include uh, the .com? I mean, I know there's a there's plugins for standalone WordPress for web mentions and the various indie media. Um, in fact, WordPress is is sort of a key platform for independent uh, web indie web. But how about WordPress.com? Do they incorporate that stuff too? I'm, I'm not sure if .com does. There are there are plugins available to support the IndieWeb uh, protocols for for WordPress, but I, I I still think that it requires a little technical knowledge to to have that experience. I mean, it'd be kind of interesting if if WordPress.com and Tumblr, Pinterest, all all of these various sites where people share content, if all of those things incorporated 
uh, either IndieWeb Technologies or Activity Pub, or if we ultimately had a had a a huge network where everything could be shared, I mean, I mean, anything could be shared with anybody. Right. Yeah. It, that, that's at least from my perspective, um, the, what the Fediverse is, uh, you know, other than us geeks, nobody understand, nobody cares about the plumbing. Whereas this kind of, you know, protocol, that kind of protocol, and it's going to evolve anyway. The question is, can I talk to my friends and can I use a variety of different media from short versions uh, like Twitter to long versions like blogging or, you know, WordPress or the traditional indie web format? And image sharing like pixel fed and you know the started discussions uh, like Lemmy and so forth can they all be part of the same network and for me you know the, the Fediverse and the indie web are identical twins that somehow were separated at birth and then they went in those slightly different directions and um you know uh, and the, it, it shows but i very much hope that over time we can bring them back together because they're, you know, we have different technical plumbing underneath, and so there's different consequences of how this works. But this is, I think, a a minor a minor issue. Um, uh, I think this can be brought together, and you know, there's other there's other protocols popping up uh, from Blue Sky to you know various other kinds of um, de decentralized social kind of protocols, and there will be more. Uh, I think the the question is, you know, can we get out of this mode that some people like to be in, which is, no, my standard is better than your standard. Uh, and therefore, I will only talk this one. Can we get to something that is, uh, what's the value you want to provide to the user? And let's make the technology to do so. And that's certainly what I want to do, uh, work on. You know, this is one of the reasons why we're building a, a Fediverse developer network so developers can find each other and make actually things interoperate so it, the, the user can actually get um, the value out of this network and not say, oh, it stops here because this is an indie website. We can't really have that. <laughs> right? All of that should go together. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the thing to do would be if you're if people are going to develop other protocols to figure out how to make them interoperable, make all the protocols interoperable so that you can still, you know, cross those bounds so that you're not setting up a bunch of borders that can't be penetrated. And uh, there's there is the there, there's okay. actually a lot of things, things being built like that uh, today. There is a bridge to Noster. Um, then you know, Ryan Barrett has, has been working a lot in, with his Bridgey uh, project to integrate um, the, the Fediverse and the IndieWeb and also Blue Sky. And so these things are all popping up um, underneath. Uh, I think there's still a lot to do to make this you know, more than just uh, a proof of concept, something that the geeks like, so, but something that can actually address a larger mainstream you know, user. But it is all pointing in the right, right direction. Yeah, and then there's just the matter of making it usable. And and I think there's another distinction to be made between, I mean, we're kind of talking about things that are about public sharing of information, more or less public sharing of information or community sharing of information. But there are, I guess you'd say, kind of walled gardens that uh, have their own uh, I guess, rationales for operating the way they do. I'm thinking of, for instance, the well, and you guys have visited the well recently, so you kind of know how the well works. And, and of course, the well sort of depends on being closed off. It's a, a, a community of a, a certain number of people. I, I don't know how many users the well could have and still be as useful as it is, or as much of a community as it is. I know what happens when you scale something like that is like what happened with Reddit, where you just basically have chunks of community all over the place that are leveraging the same platform, the same technology, but they're different communities. But there's also, I'm thinking about Discord. How does Discord fit into all this? You don't really want to open Discord servers up for sharing in the same way you do a Mastodon server, right? So that's a that's a tough one um, because I think de it depends on who you ask. Uh, I think maybe the uh, the comparison is more with Matrix, which is sort of an open, you know, a, a reasonably open up uh, version of of these kinds of um, Discord like products. And um, what one thing we don't have in the Fediverse right now is a, a, a first class concept that's a group 
um, like the way we had it, we would have it in Facebook groups, or we would have it even in the Reddit uh, forums or, or the well. But some people are working on this. And it's a little unclear how exactly that matches. Because, you know, in a group, right, you have this hard boundary saying nothing leaves this group unless it's very specifically shared out. But social media is sort of the opposite, which is like, I want as many people over here, what I say, <laughs> as possible, right? Um, but I think practically what we need to do is we need to build a technological plumbing where all of these things become possible. And then as a user, it doesn't become a matter of, I have to use a different app to do something different but I can participate in the same network, but different parts of this network have different characteristics. Some are like a closed room and there's walls and the windows are closed. So I can say what I want to say here and oh, it stays in this room, but I can open the windows or I can take away the walls and more people can hear it. All of these things on top of the, of the same network, I think would be much more valuable than having it all self pipe You know, because everybody hates, for example, reassembling the same set of uh, people and friends and maintaining the same list uh, in a, a dozen different uh, messaging and social media applications. That makes no sense. There, there is a, uh, a fork of Mastodon called a uh, hometown, which uh, allows the administrator to give the users options so that their messages aren't federated to the rest of the Fediverse. So that's, that's one option. Well, my interest, of course, uh, seems to be uh, podcasting lately <laughs> for quite some time. Is podcasting possible on the Fediverse? Is, is that being done? So um, this is a good question. And I don't have, Tom, do you have a good answer? Because I don't have a good answer. I have only one, um, one uh, data point. Yeah, it, it seems like it'd be an easy thing to rig up, but I, I, I don't know of any ones in particular. So so recently, um, somebody started a, uh, Mike McHugh at, um, at Flipboard, which is a commercial company, started a podcast on specifically on um, uh, social media called uh, Dot Social. Uh, and they decided that they were going to publish this into the Fediverse with a uh, video sharing, um, actually audio, it's, it's audio and video sharing um, 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 Fediverse um, software. So it is part of this. It's not specifically made for podcasting, I, I believe, but it, it certainly can be used for that. Well, I, I can think of something there. I, just look at Plutopia. When, when this podcast is published, it will appear on a website as an audio stream. You, you'll be able to stream it there. It will be shared across many podcasting platforms. Uh, we have, I don't know, probably a dozen different platforms that will pick it up. And, uh, and various people who get their podcasts from all those platforms will have access to it. Uh, we'll share a video version of it on YouTube, so they'll have access to it there. And then I'll be posting links and Scoop will be posting links in various social media like Facebook, Mastodon, Blue Sky, Threads. Uh, I've stopped posting to Twitter because I think that it's kind of a lost cause. But, but you know, I, it, it, there's one recording, really, one basic, fundamentally one basic recording, but it's being shared in multiple spaces. Uh, the one thing that we lack is we don't have a good way to have, like we can get feedback. People can give us feedback on YouTube. They can give us feedback on various other platforms on our website, whatever. But there's no way to pull all of that feedback together in one place. Yeah, if people are commenting. Yeah, you know, I think what you're doing here is your manual version of the Fediverse, right? Which is you say, mm -hmm. I have really one set of listeners. It just happens to be distributed over a dozen different platforms. And boy, is this a pain because I now need to paste, copy paste the same content out there so the different subsets of people can get it through these different channels that are not connected today. And then the other way too, now they're commenting over there and I want to pull this back together in one place. Wouldn't it be nice if my YouTube subscribers could see what people said on Mastodon about the same content? I mean, why are they separate, right? And so you're implementing a manual version of the Fediverse and the vision certainly is that all of these things could connect, in which case you post your content in one place, you get all the comments back in one place 
And that's the kicker, the content will be posted under the brand you own. It's not some account on Facebook or some account on YouTube. No, it's your own website. I think that is so, a, a much, much better version of how this is supposed to be working. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about pros and cons both ways. Uh, to me, it seems like it's a good thing that when, so we have a standard and that's, uh, you know, the uh, uh, feed that we create. We create an RTF feed. Uh, is that right? RTF? What? RSS. RSS. Uh, RSS, yes. An RSS feed, or it could be an Atom feed, one or the other. But in this case, an RSS feed. The RSS feed uh, enables all these different platforms to, to uh, our content with their platform. And... Uh, that seems like a good mode of distribution, but I guess what we're saying is that the weakness of it is that it's one way. Exactly. So, you know, some people describe the, the Fediverse or specifically activity pub underneath as two way RSS. And you have to little squint a little to, to agree with that one, but it is not entirely wrong so that you both syndicate out like an RSS feed would, would let you do, but also kind of get everything back in that comes in, in, in response to that. Um, you know, ultimately, I think, you know, RSS is another one of those um, uh, uh, twins separated by birth. We're all trying to do the same thing here. Uh, and unfortunately, like the, the history of RSS and Adam shows um, that people fight over things that are really not worth fighting. There was no re need, technical need to create Adam over RSS, but it forked the community and it didn't help with adoption. Um, and we hope that we can sort of avoid this a little, you know, another thing that um that I'm involved in is uh, we're building a test suite for the for the Fediverse. So Tom was alluding to that uh, earlier. Uh, got a little bit of uh, funding from the European Union for that. And the idea here is to make transparent of who actually interoperates with whom. And as a very minimum sort of, you know, make clear what that is so that some of the um, the tendencies that particularly commercial uh, parties tend to have in you know, embracing and making not quite work. And my sound is the only way can, can, can be actually at least be, you know, publicly shamed if necessary. <laughs> we will see whether that is necessary. But I think uh, uh, this is the kind of, you know, comments technology we need to have to make a, a comments network like the Fetty Wars actually work in the long term. Yeah, I, I mean, you say there wasn't any reason to create Adam. I, I was in the, that conversation when it was created. And I know that that people had certain dissatisfactions with RSS that they sought to address by creating Adam. And they felt that, that there was enough weakness in the RSS format or uh, an inflexibility, whatever, that Adam would address. But it's true, there was really no reason to do it. And, and I know that the, the podcast feeds are RSS, I mean, RSS is still widely used, and I don't think Adam is as widely used. So it never really got the adoption that RSS had. It, it doesn't really matter because from a user's perspective, it makes no difference. The only thing it does, yeah. it confuses you, right? And so what we need to do in the Fediverse, and that is a little one of the challenges we have the, the Fediverse right now, is very much still driven by the technologists. And the technologists will have very strong opinion about Adam versus RSS um, and, and things like that but it doesn't matter to the user and we need to sort of raise the conversation from it's technically this way to what matters to the user and you know it's just as an example um and i'm a sort of a, almost a lone voice on this one one of the problems that the the fediverse has today is if i post something and tom on a different server comments on it on you john see his comment um on your server and you comment on it and it sort of goes around in a decentralized system, it is possible and in fact likely that you and Scoop will not see the same comments on the same post that I made or see the same number of likes. Um, that is, there's good technical reasons why that is, but it is of course a, a terrible from a, from a usability perspective. <laughs> if you can't get on the phone with somebody and say, did you see what this guy commented on my post and they can't actually see this comment, then the product doesn't work. 
and we need to fix these kind of things. Never mind how complicated it is technically. <laughs> we need to get the, the usability in the, uh, uh, under control. And so the Fediverse has a ton of work still to be done. Uh, and and yeah. Yeah, if there is any people out there who like to build these kinds of things, come in. The, the water is warm. There's lots of innovation to be done and lots of problems to be solved. Well, I'm assuming there's probably no provision for user testing, right? Um, I'm going out on a limb here, uh, but I would expect that the number of um, user tests uh, that have been done in the Fediverse approaches zero. Yeah, I mean, uh, the user test is just people using the application and hopefully you get some feedback from them. Maybe building in some feedback mechanism could, could be helpful. Um, I, you know, I think the, the proof of the usability problem is in the fact that people are tending to gravitate to threads in blue sky, which are easier to get into and to start using, but they're also somewhat centralized, which is what we're trying to get away from. So the trick is to make decentralization work and still have it be highly usable. And as you said, address the problem of, of uh, data inconsistency. And uh, um, if that is, if that can't be done sufficiently, then what will probably happen is that Mastodon will, the people who adhere to Mastodon and use it the most are going to be people who, who understand and can live with whatever deficiencies or difficulties may be involved in using it. Yeah, you know, I think it boils down, from my perspective, it boils down to money. Uh, yeah, take, take Mastodon. It is, they have a, a very small team. They have accomplished incredible things with the amount of uh, funding and resources they've had. It's a really the shoestring of a shoestring of a budget. But take user testing, you yeah? uh, to actually do systematic user testing, it costs money. You have to have user testing professionals. You need to pay, pay your participants. You know, the, the, the money is, if you don't have the money, you can't do it, so you can't improve your product. Um, so the Fediverse needs to figure out how to make money. My personal thing is that the Fediverse needs to attract about uh, at least 100 times the amount of funding that it has today to really long term be sustainable. And that's a bit of a controversial thing, but there's so many things that need to happen. My, my personal guess is the Fediverse today runs, if you aggregate all the amount of money that you that is being spent on the Fediverse today, cash, not 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 contributions, voluntary contributions, that's somewhere between a million and ten million dollars worldwide. Um, that's sort of mostly server costs. If I've, this is my back of the envelope calculation, right? And it is simply not possible that that Fediverse can do as good of a job as a commercial application like Threads, for example that was supposedly built by a very small team, as they said, a very small team of 50 people, right? <laughs> if in the Threads world, a very small team is 50 people, and I'm sure they're expanding this now that they've been more successful than they wanted, then the, this is already more than the rest of the Fediverse has done. So we need to attract this somehow, and you know, uh, we need to find commercial models that are actually not disrupting the, the good that the Fediverse has and uh, but nevertheless uh, can attract capital so that that these kind of expenses can actually be done. You know, and another hat I wear is uh, I, I started a company called Dazzle, which is trying to do that. It's early to talk about what that is, but we're trying to connect to the Fediverse with something that actually has a business model and that is a net value add to what the Fediverse is today, uh, while having a clear you know model how this is uh, how this all paid for. <clears throat> Yeah, and I guess if you have to get investments, you have to figure out what the return on investment is going to be. Yes, but you know there there is a lot of for me there the if you put on your business strategy hat on, then the constellation with the Fediverse is not all that different from previous uh, free and open networks that we've had in technology, most notably email, right? Email is not is an open protocol anybody can connect. Uh, but there has been a lot of financial returns around e around email uh, as a protocol, from the things we might not want to see, like Hotmail, that you know was a big investment success, also advertising driven. Uh, but something like Microsoft Exchange to this day, you know, makes a lot of money, and it is based on open protocols. Uh, and these kind of businesses can be found in the in the Fediverse as well. I'm quite quite certain about that. 
Uh, and uh, and I, I don't think it would be it would serve anybody uh, if he said not on Microsoft Exchange was was evil in an open email protocol. It all has to be open source and and uh, and uh, um, and uh, you know donation supported. I think we are better off if we have Microsoft Exchange existing as one of the many implementations around email. And I think the same thing is to happen in the February. Yeah, we have so many people who who don't want to pay for various internet services because you know for the longest time pretty much anything you did or read on the internet was free we had this kind of tradition of free and then the only the the be, the most logical alternative to get away from that was to make things ad based so you, the people aren't having to pay money but they're paying with their attention but nobody wants to see ads. So they're like blocking ads or, I mean, there's a big question about how to fund all of this stuff. I don't think that there's a really good way, clearly good and viable way to get a substantial amount of funding aside from the ad-based model, which creates its own sort of issues. and. You know, we talked earlier about platform decay. The ad-based model contributes to platform decay. It kind of takes you there. So, so I would um, I would think about this a little differently, and I would look at the total amount of money an average person, like all of us here, well, we're not under average people; we're geeks. So, but the amount of money we spend on technology-related products and services every year. And the largest expenses are probably our hard, uh, hardware phones and our broadband subscriptions and our uh, cell phone subscriptions, right? If you add up all this money, this is a very significant amount of money that is directly come out of our pockets. That's not advertising support. If we wanted to fund the Fediverse, it would be a much smaller amount of money to make the Fediverse work than the amount of money that we already spent on technology today. So it seems to me there is a room for business model innovation, and there is room for repackaging some of the stack. You know, who says that a cell phone provider, for example, has to provide voice and voicemail and uh, IP connectivity, and then it stops? Right. It could be that somebody puts an extra value in the, 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 the phone. People solely tried. They usually fail to doing this, but they only try to build things on top. Now, then we would, uh, this is one example, or the broadband providers could do this, or other people that we are already paying money for. There's no ads involved. Now, it may come with downsides. So, for example, I might not really want to have my Fediverse account at tmobile.com. However, if then on the technical side, we made it easy to migrate from that to something else, just like we have phone number portability, we might have social media portability and the Fediverse has the technology for doing so, then all of a sudden it becomes very different. Now, I'm not holding my breath that the, 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 the phone and the cable companies will do this because they, they have tried to do this for the 30 years and they have always failed. <laughs> so I'm not believing that they can do it next time, but there is room to do, to do things by reconfiguring the stack that we have. And you know, I've been and you have been in technology for a long time, and as Anil uh, Dash wrote the other day uh, in the Rolling Stone, it's it's the largest uh, in in 25 years is the the largest amount of uncertainty about technology how things get reconfigured, and I'm 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 totally on board with this one. It is the 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 uncertainty in technology today with AI on one side and the regulator regulators get in there, and then the um and then the the, the open networks resulting from this one is larger than than has been for a very long time. And it creates new opportunities for new models. And it's not all it doesn't have to be ads. It wasn't ads, you know, 30 years ago, and it doesn't have to be ads for the rest of the uh, rest of our lives. Uh, it can be reconfigured. It's a good and point. I believe that. <clears throat> we have reached the end of our hour. And I feel like it's a cliffhanger. I feel like we should all come back soon and, and talk some more about it because I, uh, I could see a, a much longer discussion here. But thanks so much for joining us today. Thank well, you. Thank you for having us. Thanks, guys. That was great. Yeah, it was great. Okay, we will uh, we'll let you know when we publish, and look forward to seeing you soon. 
Sounds good. Thank you for doing this. This is a, a okay, very nice time sure. and um, good. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.